once again, I'm X to Life. I have just finished redesigning the PCBs for my Super 16 sequencer project to take advantage of some surface mount parts, which should be easier to assemble and cheaper, all of that good stuff. But I have never really worked with surface mount parts before. They're a little bit uncommon in DIY electronics. So before I start prototyping my own modules, I thought I had better try my hand uh, at a design from someone who knows what they're doing. And this is the Mutable Instruments Braids. It's designed by Emily Gillet, and it's a module that I've always wanted to have in my setup. Uh, this is the Brad's version by Modular Addict, by the way. So today we are going to try our hand at some hot air soldering and working with some surface mount parts, see if we can get some teeny teeny tiny SMD devices to work in this circuit. Okay, here's the Mizan Plus. Since we're doing uh, surface mount parts, we don't need a circuit board holder, we can just solder flat on any surface we like. I've got some really tiny tweezers for those 0603 parts, flux pen, which is super important for surface mount work, some capped on tape in case we need to protect something from heat when we're using the hot air, a soldering iron set to a reasonable lead temperature. I really need to replace that tip. This hoof tip should be useful for doing uh, some of the bigger ICs, and this hot air gun, which I really haven't had much of a chance to play with yet. So let's get under some magnification and have a closer look. So I think we're going to start with the most difficult part, which is the 32-pin quad flat pack microcontroller, the STM32F. We're going to have a go at using a hoof tip, which has a little kind of flat surface on one side that you can use to drag solder these tiny little microcontroller pins. Before we solder, we're going to apply some flux. Flux is always handy, and we'll just get some solder onto these as in the corners. itself. Looks okay, I don't think I damaged any of the traces. Only three more to go, right? And then we can do these massive mega pitch SOICs. Okay, I think that is our first IC soldered. Everything else on the board should be relatively easy compared to this. One more really teeny tiny one, and that is this digital to analog converter. This is an SSOP8 package, and it weighs almost nothing, so it's really quite difficult to handle. Okay, now that we've got all of our ICs soldered on, we are going to start putting on some smaller parts. These are little 0603 resistors, and I've got some capacitors as well. And we could do this certainly by the same method, just put a little bit of solder on a pad, tack down the resistor, and then solder the other side. But I thought we might try out using some solder paste, and this is how uh, it's done in mass production. You have a template where you smear the solder paste through, but you can actually with this little syringe, just apply it to each individual pad and then use hot air to reflow 
all of the components. So rather than doing the same thing the whole way through, let's try out a new method and use solder paste to put all these components on the board. Resistors are just flying right off the pads. I'm going to take another tack and do a little bit of experimenting and just see if I can figure out the hot air settings that work best. 255 degrees. You can see it's melting the flux. That looks completely burnt, but hey, let's keep going. We're doing experiments. 285 degrees. to reflow and not much of anything is happening. Oh, oh, starting to see it. There we go. It takes a little while. Isn't that magic? It takes a little while. I might want to increase the airflow a little bit here. And you can see how that actually pulls the parts into position. What's the lesson? Failure isn't when you don't succeed, it's when you stop trying. Now we could do these electrolytic capacitors with hot air, but I have a suspicion that it'll actually be easier to solder them with the soldering iron. Okay, now we are ready to install the display modules and the other through-hole parts like the potentiometers and the jacks. But I'm actually going to try and program the microcontroller first because we just want to make sure that everything has been done properly so far and that we can talk to the microcontroller and get it running before we put on the expensive parts like the display modules and the pots. Okay, so I went to uh, program this board using my ST-Link V2. Uh, but then I realized that the programming header is actually this mini JTAG one, and it is 1.2 millimeter pin pitch, and the uh, programming jumpers on this ST Link and its header are a standard 2.54 millimeter pin pitch, like this header here. So there's no way we're going to be able to make the connections that we need to make. So we need to desolder this header and put in some wires that are actually the right size for the jumpers that we've got.
this is definitely not the best way to do things. I've got my programmer plugged into USB and I figured out which of the pins correspond to the pins on the headers by looking at some serial programming diagrams from the uh, ST website. It's a pain to solder these pins in, it's a pain to get them connected. It's better just to get the right connector uh, or the right programmer that connects to this. I'm not sure why they're using mini JTAG on this board, but clearly that's a decision. Uh, that Emily Hulet has made that makes it easier for them. It does seem to be connected, uh, and it's reporting that it's connected to a 32-pin chip here. Uh, it's got 3.3 volt target voltage, so we should be able to load the bootloader We're in device low power mode, 128k flash. Uh, we can open a file, the braids bootloader, and then I believe we just say target program. And then we can start. Alright, so I've got this big jumble of wires hanging out at the back, but we'll deal with those later. We just gotta tape them off and make sure they don't short out. Uh, but I think I was able to program the firmware and the bootloader successfully, so now it's time to put in some of the other through-hole parts and see if we can get the display to work and some signals to come in and out. should be enough to let us know if the display is working and we can input data maybe select a mode or a waveform I'm not sure how this thing boots but let's try that and see if it works all right so after a while trying to troubleshoot and bug fix this thing uh, I don't think it is in working shape yet and uh, what's worse is that now when I connect the power this chip heats up which is a problem because I think that means is a short and in fact when I measure the uh, conductivity between the 3.3 volt rail and ground it's about 2 ohms so that's not good I think I've fried this IC I'm trying to look for shorts and took off some capacitors that didn't help uh, and then just by using the temperature test plugging it in and seeing what got hot there's a couple components there's the voltage regulator because a lot of currents coming through there's the current limiting uh, 4.7 ohm resistor that gets hot and there's this IC so I think we're at the point where we have to desolder this and then power it up and see if that fixes our current short circuit. Uh, and at that point we can go maybe looking around and seeing if there are any other shorts um, that may have caused this chip to fail. Ta-da! It's working! Well, at least the display is working. I'm not 100% sure what was wrong. I think there were a couple pins shorted on this IC. I reflowed them, and I took off a couple of the other ICs because it seemed like there was some kind of fault on the 3.3 volt line. Um, so I just took everything off of that, and I've been putting pieces back slowly. And I finally got this programmed, and with the shift registers on here, the display now works. So, now to put things back on one at a time and see if I can get the rest of it working. Okay. I've got the other ICs on, the display is still working alright, and we can still scroll through our waves. And I've hooked up the output jack, and it does appear to be producing a waveform, and we can even select a couple different ones, although we can't adjust the pitch or the gain at the moment. So I've been playing around with this a little bit, and it looks like the display is working, the firmware is working, the oscillator tuning is working, 
and you know we can select different waveforms but most of the waveforms look pretty similar in fact they mostly look like square waves with a few exceptions but this first one is actually supposed to be a sawtooth wave so I believe there is something wrong in the output state somewhere between the digital part and the analog part so I probed around a bit and I noticed that these uh, 39 kilo ohm resistors that I put in are not actually 39 kilo ohms, they're 39 ohms. So I'm off by a factor of a thousand, and clearly we're getting a bunch of clipping on all of these waveforms because the feedback loop for the amplification is all wrong. So I need to get in there and swap out those resistors. Found another resistor near this op amp that's the wrong value. Uh, this one is supposed to be 25 kilo ohms, and it's 100 ohms. These SMD parts, uh, some of them have little codes printed on them, some of them don't. They certainly don't have the, uh, the nice color-coded system that through-hole resistors do, so it is easier to misplace them or to misidentify them, but clearly I need to be a lot more careful when I'm uh, picking and placing this stuff by hand, because I am uh, not doing a great job so far. Alright, let's have one more kick at the cat and uh, see what we get. Yeah, look at that. I don't know what any of these waves are or how they sound, but I'm super excited to use them and fold them and modulate them. There's really nothing like an old cathode ray oscilloscope. If you're in the market for one and you're considering getting a, uh, a digital oscilloscope instead, really consider picking up one of these. You can get them secondhand for uh, very cheap. This one I think was about 50 bucks on eBay. And for doing synthesizer stuff, you don't need the like high bandwidth digital scopes. You know, this is 35 megahertz. That's more than you're ever gonna see if you're dealing with like audio signals. But the bandwidth on this is plenty for just looking at waveforms, uh, seeing how they behave, double checking that things are working, and it looks beautiful. I mean, you just can't beat it. So yeah, this is my sales pitch for uh, vintage cathode ray oscilloscopes. So I'm super psyched. That went really well. It took a while, but I learned a lot about uh, soldering and uh, even a little bit about 32-bit programming with this STM32F. But uh, I would really like to hear how this module sounds. And in order to do that, we got to get it in the modular. And in order to do that, we need to have a front panel on this thing. Uh, I'm a little bit pressed for time. I don't want to fabricate a metal panel today. So I'm just going to hack something together out of something flat, relatively easy to work with. Well, I think that counts as a successful introduction to surface mount soldering on this mutable instrument's braids, or brads, as the case may be. Next, obviously, I want to think about getting a proper faceplate up onto this module, and maybe getting some of the latest firmware, or perhaps even some alternate firmware for it. I know there's stuff that has really advanced capabilities. Uh, but before that, I really need to think about doing some power line filtering on this module, because 
Hoo boy, is it noisy. It, you may remember that I had some power line noise problems with the display on my Super 16. I managed to quash that with uh, an LC filter on the power supply, but this module is even noisier than mine, which is, in a way, a little bit reassuring, I suppose, because I know mine isn't way out of the norm. So I think I might try and have two separate power supplies for this case, one for digital modules and one for analog modules, have a top row and a bottom row, and two different bus boards. And I think I remember Look Mum No Computer making a video on building a modular touring case, uh, doing exactly the same thing, having two separate power supplies, for exactly the same reason, because Braids is a very noisy module. Before I go, I want to say a huge thanks to everyone who has joined me over on Patreon. It really means a lot to me to have your support, and it means that I'm able to take more time to edit these videos and try and make them more frequently. And if you're interested in getting early access to all of my videos, plus a little bit of bonus content, head on over to patreon.com slash extra life, or click the link down below and become a supporter today. Thank you as always for watching. I hope you enjoyed getting into some surface mount soldering as much as I did. I know it's going to come in really handy. So keep your irons hot, take it easy, and I will see you next time.